Dear participants, I'm glad to welcome you to the 2020 Global Landscapes Forum on Biodiversity. This is plenary two on harnessing the power of nature and more precisely how financial institutions integrate the local community's perspective. My name is Mariam Pril. I am head of cooperation and sustainable development at Crédit Agricole du Maroc, and I will have the pleasure to moderate this session. I'm extremely honored to welcome four knowledgeable resource person. We have Amalia Souza. She is founder and executive director of Casa Social Environmental Fund, an organization promoting environmental conservation and sustainability, respect for social environmental rights and social justice. We also have Priya Shayan Sunda. She is lead economist at the Nature Conservancy, a global environmental nonprofit aiming to conserve the land and waters. Third, we have Jennifer Price, president and CEO of Calvert Impact Capital, a nonprofit investment firm that works with investors to move capital into communities that are overlooked by traditional finance. And last but not least, Martin Berg, partner at Pollination Group, a climate change advisory and investment firm, building out investment ideas for environmental asset classes. Our session will run for 45 minutes and I will be asking one or two questions to each panelist and they will have around four minutes in total to respond in order to keep time to interact with the audience and take some of the questions that you will send. But before we start, let me quickly set up the stage. Today, we are all aware of the fact that our economies rely on nature. There is widespread scientific consensus on the fact that environmental degradation has already reached levels that endanger the stability of ecosystems and that these ecosystems underpin the global economy through the provision either of stock, of natural capital, of flow, of ecosystem services. And the COVID crisis that we're living in right now has reinforced this awareness and the urgency for action. It has shown that our economy and our health are strongly intertwined with the ecosystem's health and biodiversity. But as you all know, promoting sustainable patterns of production and consumption requires to scale up the biodiversity finance while increasing its impact on the environment and on local communities. So during this session, we will focus more on how this impact could be maximized in order to pay or remunerate the nature stewardship and encourage environmental action at the local level. Working for Crédit Agricole du Maroc, Morocco's National Bank for Agriculture Financing and Smallholder Farmers Financial Inclusion, I can bring a small testimony on the complexity of the issue. Providing adequate financing to smallholder farmers while expecting a sustainable land use management is quite a challenge. You have to take into account the diversity of agricultural production, as well as site specific constraints in terms of soil water, waste management, et cetera, and bring, it to, and bring it together to develop the adequate financing product for the smallholders and local communities. And that brings me to the core issue that comes from it. How can sustainable finance or biodiversity finance bring overall benefits to local communities and what are the key conditions to ensure these final beneficiaries are positively impacted by the financing? And subsequently, how can we monitor this impact in the most cost effective and accurate way? As you know, we are progressing a lot on the measurement of the impact on biodiversity and progressing also on the harmonization of these indicators, the indicators that are used to calculate the company's biodiversity footprint. So to which extent do we correctly assess the impact on local communities? And do we have enough common standards and indicators for this purpose? So uh, we will start our panel discussion with Amalia Souza. Maria 
or Amalia, sorry, you have dedicated your career to channeling financial resources to the most excluded grassroots groups. In your point of view, how can these philanthropic funds bring benefits to the most vulnerable population groups in rural areas, and in particular for forest communities? And maybe you can help us set up the stage on how the use or the purpose of these funds have evolved over the year. And my second question is about the key conditions that can ensure forest communities are positively impacted by sustainable finance mechanisms. Hello, thank so you. The floor is yours. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm glad to be able to be here with you. Um, well, this is a very big question. <laughs> and so I just wanted to start with the premise uh, that we need to save life, sustaining biomes of this planet, right? That's what this, this conversation is all about, for people and for all beings. And maybe we, our human, human focus <laughs> is, has, is a lot in food production, uh, and because of that, we've created mechanisms that have actually damaged the planet severely. Large production of commodities, for example. And right now, our focus must be on how to preserve and restore the important biomes of this planet. And interestingly enough, if you look mostly in the global south, right, where we still hold the majority of the biodiverse regions of this planet and more, more intact. They are intact because there are people there. Empty spaces have been destroyed already. And there are people there not only learning and gar uh, as guardians and stewards of these places, but they are also now defending these places with their own lives. So I think this is an important place to start. Um, we, so how do you actually support them? and to engage, to improve their livelihoods, because of course they need, they've been excluded from all benefits. They've been in remote regions and now more than anything, they are threatened, you know, the, the violence increases in these places where, because uh, there's a lot of interest. Also the global South, South has the history of being providers of raw material. And we are not putting enough value on the importance of these biomes, of how, how much they can offer to the planet, including in sustaining life. So we as a fund, as a small grants fund that started by, was started by local actors, we wanted to make sure that we were meeting these communities where they are. You need to start, so in our view, we need to start with small investments as seed funding, May, all of them, they know what they want. They know what they have around them. They want to keep their that way of life, but of course with benefits, right? With health and, and all, all that they have the right to as a, as a member of society. So uh, starting where they are uh, with infrastructure, there's a lot of investment to be made to actually uh, uh, even enable them to think and, and prepare for engaging in maybe value chains of so many products that they that the forest actually offers us. The thing is, whatever is being uh, extracted from the forest doesn't doesn't uh, involve the right math, right? The, we are not considering that those products have uh, not only the value in themselves, like the Brazil nut or the acai or some of the oils, but they have the value of maintaining our planet's biodiversity. And I think we are starting with a very unbalanced, in a very unbalanced place because we're not valuing, we're not putting the right kind of dollar amount on the real value of that these populations and that these products actually offer us. So, um, we see, you know, there are many possibilities, uh, but mostly uh, we, we have to remember that these people occupy large territories, that they are collective occupations. They're not even ownership uh, per se, per se. So we need to think about them as groups and collectives 
that have a purpose together, extractive reserves, the sustainable development reserves, uh, indigenous territories, the Quilombola territories, you know, the runaway slaves here in Brazil, at least, uh, they, they are traditional people recognized for the territories. They are resettled communities of family farmers that work together, produce together and reach the market together. So more than just thinking about production and small holdings, which of course exist in more traditional family farming regions for food production, mostly for urban centers. But if we're looking at protecting entire ecosystems, we are always thinking about collective. So if we think about scaling up, you know, may we, we have this economic economist language, right? We need to think of how, how do you scale up good um, examples of sustainable production. I think the scaling is in the, in the number of communities engaged in the production because there, it's not by chance that the, the places where they live are the most protected is because they have a lifestyle that allows them to have a real life, you know, we call the uh, buen vivir in, in the Latin American context, right? A good life where they produce for themselves and sustain a, and subsistence living right now is more important than ever. And COVID just brought just you no know, through that in our faces. And then once, once you have, and then they can engage and they want to engage in selling some of their products but the scale is not necessarily one community scaling up the production is how many communities we are able to engage and to improve the lives of. So I think this is, you know, I, I'm not sure how long I, I already took, but um, I just wanted to leave you with uh, the, the thought that, um, that really what, what kept the places functioning, these places that are important for biodiversity are, are the communities who live there. So we need to learn and adapt ourselves to make the best investments in them and by default in our own futures. Uh, our own future. <laughs> so anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much for your intervention. It provides a very interesting outlook on uh, the impact of biodiversity. So recognition uh, I keep that word very important word, the recognition of the people, the communities, the recognition of the goods that they produce, and also uh, the recognition of the ecosystem they're living in. And then the need for a collective action and groups and, uh, and at ecosystem level in order to have the maximum impact. And as you said, to scale up uh, what we're doing and the positive impact of the finance. And I would like to uh, turn now to uh, uh, Priya. She's a renowned lead economist, and I think she can uh, bring her view to that specific point on the additional efforts that could be developed to include more local communities, so she can add up to what you have just said, and maybe also think about the other sectors that uh, encompass biodiversity. Uh, we've been talking more about forestry, uh, maybe other sectors need different actions to be taken. So Priya, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Um, Maria, I think, took us straight to the ground and gave us a sense of what communities uh, do to live the good life and take care of the ecosystem services that provide them with the good life. Um, and what I am going to do is maybe start a little bit with the big picture. So take you know, sort of broaden that vision that Maria presented to us, which was right at the ground level and sort of look at the world uh, a, a little bit from a distance to understand, again, maybe this, this uh, word that is much used and possibly abused, but to understand the scale of the challenge that we face. 
and Miriam, I'm sorry, I'm going to start with forest again, because I was just part of a global assessment on forest trees and poverty that was just launched last week. And so I'd like to draw from this to address sort of this larger question of how do you bring uh, biodiversity and forest related finance to local communities and smallholders. So, so just to set the stage, there is this, as Maria rightly said, this huge overlap between forest biodiversity and where people live, particularly poor people. So one quarter of the world's people live within five kilometers of a forest. More than a billion people derive direct and indirect benefits from forests and trees. 40% of the extreme rural poor, people who live on less than uh, $1.9 per day, around 250 million people live in forest and savanna areas. So I say this to really just expose the fact that any effort to finance land-based biodiversity conservation inevitably has to be aligned with the needs the aspirations and the social norms associated with these local communities. Let's look at the other side of the coin, finance, right? At least in the forestry sector, our data suggests that public international financing for forestry, public aid, which is at about 1.7 billion per year, is either stagnant or declining. In contrast, it is estimated that you need about 70 to $160 billion annually for sustainably managing uh, the world's forests. We had a recent estimate, TNC was part of this, and they put the financing gap for biodiversity overall at 600 to $800 billion per year. So even if these estimates are off, you know, the, the gap is very clear. So this really suggests that the role of private sector, private financing is not just critical, but it's absolutely essential if we want to do biodiversity conservation, sustainable forestry, and support the poor who live within these lands. Now, private financing becomes operational mainly through market-based mechanisms, impact investments in certification, improved supply chains for commodity markets, ecotourism, PS, what have you, right? A lot of the private financing comes in this way. However, for rural, particularly uh, local communities, smallholder community, communities, to access and gain from these market-driven activities, we need at least in my mind, four additional areas of investment, uh, if they are really to gain. These are, they sort of build on what Maria was already saying, but I'll just categorize these. These are related to first, improving productivity and skills. If you have new markets, you want to meet communities where they are, but for them to participate in broader market-oriented activities, if that is their desire, that you need skill building and training that is not just technical, but in issues such as financial literacy. Strengthening rights, Maria alluded to this, and there are all kinds of complexities. You know, it's not just individual rights, but it's community rights and whatnot. And because these rights are insecure, you have problems associated with land grabbing, with elite capture, with social unrest and conflict. The new monitoring technologies that are so good for conservation and important for market organization, they can work against smallholders, especially when rights are unclear. Communitarian institutions become, become, are particularly vulnerable when they face demand from market commodities. You know, institutions that were working well can break down. The third point I want to make is that if you really want to address smallholder issues, you have to understand that they live in very remote areas. And so you will need some special infrastructure and institutional investments, particularly to address the remoteness and the lack of connectivity, which is so essential for entrepreneurial activity. Remoteness also means less political power. So they 
are not able to address the unfavorable regulatory and policy conditions that may uh, affect them. Finally, market access, you know, for smallholders and particularly access needs to be strengthened. There's a lot of evidence about improving smallholder access to agricultural markets, for instance, much less evidence in the forestry space. But there are four challenges here. One is that smallholders are small. That's what they are. So they may need to pool resources. We've got to figure out a way to aggregate resources so they can access the markets. They face variable and possibly very high transaction costs of participation. Certification schemes, for example, transaction costs can preclude smallholder participation. So you need to worry about this. Credit constraints, if they want to obtain inputs, particularly in the forestry sector, uh, you would know this very well, Miriam. Um, market risks, uh, smallholders do not are not in a position to bear risks. So sort of smoothing income, all of these considerations are very important if, you, if they need to participate in market-oriented activities. So I'll end by noting that there are many challenges, just as you started out saying, Miriam. And I think the way forward, because we are dealing with smallholders, the way forward is to really be thinking about public-private partnerships. Blended financing is likely to be absolutely essential. So local communities can gain by improved financing from biodiversity conservation. Thank you. I hope I didn't take too much time. Thank you, Bria, that's fine. And I would like to um, jump on the idea that you have mentioned, which is the role of private finance and uh, capital markets and uh, turn to uh, Jennifer Price from Calvert Impact Capital. Uh, I think she can provide some of the answers that you uh, for the question that you were mentioning. So as an impact investor, uh, Jennifer, can you tell us to which extent uh, does your financing approach complement the work that is done on the ground by NGOs or philanthropy organization? Uh, how does it respond to the constraints that uh, Priya has just mentioned? And uh, the fact maybe that uh, the, the, the farmers or the smallholders uh, cannot bear the risk. So how do you uh, adapt this when you, uh, when you uh, try to reach uh, those, uh, those uh, communities? And if you can give us some examples, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Miriam, and hello to everyone. As Miriam introduced me, I'm a practitioner. Um, an impact investor is the jargon. As we do our work here at Calvert Impact Capital, what we're trying to do is exactly what Priya outlined, is engage private capital to mainstream uh, conservation finance. And in fact, mainstream a lot of the investments that are just simply overlooked by traditional finance. And, and what that means just is very much, there is a whole part of our ecosystem that's just not connected to traditional markets. Um, they can't walk into a bank and get a loan. Um, their business um, perhaps per is perceived to be very risky. So going and finding finance on the capital markets or raising equity is extremely challenging. And so they get left out, they get left behind. And that is the case often what we see with these very local community investments that are really at the part of preserving a lot of the biodiversity of our planet. And so the question is, how do we engage these communities? How do we engage these product, projects so that they can access financing and be able to scale and grow the work that is protecting our planet and moving us into a place of sustainability? And so those overlooked markets, um, they're overlooked for a few reasons we see. One is that the perceived risk is higher than the real risk. So investors perceive them as very risky, perhaps because of the country they're located in or because the business model they're using has never been tested or proven before. Um, we also see that at times there's a market failure, just there's a misunderstanding or not a lot of data or track record of investing in these assets. So someone just needs to demonstrate that they're investable. And so for all these reasons, 
that is what we're doing is we at Calvert Impact Capital, we demonstrate that these investments can be financed. Um, they can return environmental as well as social returns. And then we seek to educate investors, which is very, very important. Um, we're educating them about these types of opportunities. So one, they ask for more and two, so we can do more of this work. And then finally we scale. Um, but importantly, how do we integrate the local community perspective is very much through intermediaries. And I wanna emphasize this, uh, Miriam, you said show examples. Um, the work we do is very much based on working with intermediaries, working with local impact funds. Um, we do not have people in all the places in the deep in the communities where the capital is needed. So we work with the local financial institutions, the local impact funds that are based there to really understand what the community need is and ensure that our capital is meeting that need. Um, so we sit between you know, the capital markets, talking to people at JP Morgan saying, you know, give us your money for this reason. And then the community intermediary that is telling us what the community needs. And so two key things there is one, yes, we wanna scale this work. So what I said before, demonstrate, educate and scale is important, but we also need to remain nimble. In this moment in time, things are very fluid. Um, crises happen, like we're seeing unfold here. It's vital that we don't get too wed to our processes or procedures and that we stay nimble so our capital can be very responsive to what's happening in place. And a quick example of that is um, we put out a press release with Eco Business Fund Finance the Motion as the fund manager earlier this week how we bought from their portfolio, which is invested in financial institutions and projects and businesses in Latin America focused on biodiversity efforts. We bought from their portfolio some of their season loans, loan participations. That freed up room for them to do more in community. And so simple things like this, um, but being able to respond quickly, collaborate and be nimble are vital in this moment in time. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And I would like to uh, build on what you have just said with Martin. Uh, Martin, we have uh, recently seen many initiatives, uh, positive initiatives paving the way towards making a specific asset uh, class for biodiversity projects and uh, pollination, uh, pollination or the partnership between uh, pollination and HSBC is probably one of uh, these uh, initiatives. I would like to hear you on maybe two points. The COVID crisis, we didn't talk a lot about it right now. So how uh, did it make it more justify and urgent to link financial, social and environmental uh, impacts and secondly, how you make sure to comply with all these uh, impact requirements in your business model and investment ideas. Of course, if you can illustrate these points, that would be very grateful. Yes, hello. Thank you very, very much, Mariam. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, as I said, um, my name is Martin Burke. Um, um, many of you may still know me from the European Investment Bank, where I spent the last, uh, nearly last uh, 10 years. Um, so I, um, as Mayim said, I recently joined uh, Pollination and it was actually an advisory and investment firm um, to help them out building uh, investment ideas. And one of the ideas we, we now built out recently is really to see how we could get natural capital more um, uh, to scale. I mean, we heard a lot about that. Um, I think a lot of what was discussed earlier here today was really focused on how can we scale our projects, but also we have to um, on the, we have to also really scale up in, in, in the type of um, finance that is available for, for natural capital, for nature in, 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 in general. And that's really what this uh, joint venture is about. Um, um, so maybe as since, since you, you asked about COVID, well, firstly, we should probably say um, we, we only started discussing this uh, with HSBC uh, uh, well, just before COVID actually happened in February. And then the whole joint venture was actually negotiated during COVID, um, which is an interesting experience because we actually never met um, all of the counterparties there. But I think you, you raised a good point. I think COVID, I think, um, highlighted in, in my mind two things in a way. 
Um, one is really the need for uh, impact investment on the ground because we really see that uh, that the uh, also the impact of COVID is is, is really um, uh, the hardest on the ground. But also um, um, there's I think there is also a rethink on on uh, on the investor side. Um, I think COVID has highlighted a little bit the relationship um, between. Um, in, between the economy, between our well-being, um, um, and, and and nature, and I think m m many many of, especially even even larger investors, really really we think, oh, um, this is not something where we should actually engage much more. And um, we realize this now also in discussions we're having with investors that there is actually an interest to 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 discuss this. Um, but you asked a little bit how we, you know, how, how we want to do this. So I think um, perhaps I should mention, so the, the goal of this joint venture we're having with, with HSBC is really to build a very an, an, a large scale um, investment offering for institutional investors. And I think that's unfortunately at the moment really, really lacking that um, large capital has difficulties to actually um, um, access um, uh, nature as an investment in theme um, um, in general. Um, so, so the idea with, with, um, with, with our vehicle is, 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 is really offer large scale investment opportunities. Now you will obviously say yes, that may leave out um, a lot of the smallholders. And I think that's exactly something perhaps that we should also discuss here. I mean, how we, how we can make the link. And I think um, Jennifer made some, some, some very interesting points um, on um, how it can, can still be, still be um, achieved. And that's really, um, um, something we're trying to do. So they, with, with the vehicle that we're trying to do, we will probably um, also um, target a lot of the more developed markets because we believe there's a lot of nature investment uh, in, in, in developed market as well. But for um, uh, more emerging markets, um, we have to exactly work um, through partners um, and, and, and through probably also through, through intermediaries to really uh, reach the smaller projects and also the smallholders on the ground. I think um, it's difficult to come in as a, as a last person because of many of the things were already, already mentioned, what I would have said, but I think one of the other things that we probably should focus on is um, um, it's not uh, only seeing how we can better um, engage the smallholders, but also how we can engage, uh, how we can build the infrastructure um, in, so that, that actually the smaller projects, which, and, and, and that's one thing we're seeing, that's one of the challenges we're seeing on, on, on landscape projects, um, um, and um, that, that there are multiple revenue streams, but often the, the projects are quite small and the revenue streams are also small. So I think when we think about scale and aggregation, one of the things we, sh we should really discuss and we should really focus on to see how can actually those different, um, or this, this smaller projects, how the revenue streams of those smaller projects can be aggregated so that they become interesting for larger scale investors. And I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, there are quite a few, um, uh, intermediaries um, and other organizations are working on that. But I, I think in order to get really large scale financing flowing that reaches the smallholders, I think that's one of the key components that, uh, that we should focus on. So I'll leave it here, Marian. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I see that time is, is running and we've got quite uh, a lot of questions from our audience. We won't be able to uh, answer all of these, but maybe uh, if you can take just one minute, uh, I would like maybe to uh, go back to Amalia on, uh, on capacity building. We've had a question about capacity building. Uh, and, and I know CASA Social Environmental Fund does a lot about this. So if you can tell us just one word about this and then maybe Priya, uh, we have a question uh, on the, the um, how we can uh, how how those okay let me read it what initiatives can those of us who are not in the private sector take to motivate private sector investment in nature conservation so I think that's a very interesting question because it turns uh, to what we're saying how can we make uh, investment in nature conservation, something attractive. And uh, so Amalia, if you can react to this. And to uh, uh, and for Jennifer, maybe one minute about uh, the, the use of digitalization and new technology. Uh, as you have said, uh, investors have 
maybe a high perceived risk, and maybe the use of track record, uh, thanks to the technology, can uh, reduce this. Uh, if you can have any specific uh, example to provide uh, on this. And finally, Martin, and that will be also your concluding remarks. Uh, Martin, uh, maybe about carbon markets. I know that you've been working a lot on kind of carbon markets. How do the benefits that you can have from carbon markets redistributed and benefit also to the, to the communities, to the local communities? And please, one minute for each. Uh, Amalia, the floor is yours. Okay, well, um, I think it was a very interesting discussion because it, it's very complementary. So where we are as a fund, we are a fund uh, that's been funding South America for the last 15 years. And the reason is because biomes here are cross-border ones. We've already given uh, almost 2,500 grants in 10 countries. So I think this, this is what we're talking about, scale of small, very coordinated funding to begin for the communities to begin to get a handle of how you think a project, how do, how do you prepare a budget, and that's where the capacity building uh, aspect comes in. Not only from us that's waiting for somebody to ask for money, we're actually working within the networks of their partners and, and strengthening the, these networks uh, with the grants that are complementary to a bigger vision of protection of territories. So, uh, so capacity, so building the capacity gives them a very, it, well, you have seen over the years how fast the community that never got, not, never even knew that there was any funding for whatever they wanted to do suddenly uh, uh, get seen. They, they, the, the visibility is, is a very big one. They, they get stronger, they, they have their voices louder. And then from then on, it's so fast how they can tap into new possibilities, new partnerships, new resources even. So it definitely you need to, to meet them where they are, but they get, from there to the next stage very fast. Thank you. Um, thank you, Miriam. I'm, I'm not completely sure I understand that question, but let me just pick up on a couple of comments that I've heard, which may partially address that, uh, both from Maria just now and Martin, I think, what and Jennifer. So what, what's really clear in this conversation is the importance of these intermediaries, because there's a lot of global financing that's sloshing around, but doesn't know where to go. And the promise of sort of these major emerging markets related to natural resources has simply not taken off. And But there is this space, perhaps, for innovation with the creation of institutions and maybe platforms using technologies that will allow these kinds of intermediaries to develop, which can make this marriage happen between smallholders who need to be brought up, just like Maria you know, exposed or things clarified so that they know what is available to them. And the, the financial institutions that are looking for opportunities but can't get to these opportunities directly because it's too far away. So I think, um, I think an area for some real enterprising activity and innovation may be in the creation of all forms of intermediaries, including organizations like Maria's, but a variety of different uh, types of intermediaries. I'll uh, stop there. Thank you, Priya. Jennifer? Yeah, I think I'm Please. unmuted now. Is that right? Can you hear me, Miriam? Yes. Okay, yes. so picking up on the last word of Priya intermediaries, and I think the question was around technology, and then um, intermediaries are critical. I think two places where I see technology right now being very helpful is bringing smaller investments, like Martin said, into intermediaries. So how do you connect smaller, discrete investments and get them to an intermediary? So finding efficiency there. And then on the other end around impact and monitoring. 
So how do we ensure that the investments that are happening, the work that's being done is with the impact intention or the integrity that we are hoping are told. And so in those both ends, technology is playing a critical role. Um, that's saying the one thing I find that technology can't solve is time. You know, these investments are made and then time passes and you need time to pass to understand how this investment will season, what the outcome of that investment will be, what the returns, the impact and financial will be and shortening time, um, I have not found technology to help. And so there just is that element. And with that, I would just say one last word is, um, we all know that we're hitting a brick wall with urgency. And so patience and time kind of is a contradictory statement with where we are in the world. And so one thing I would just encourage us all to think is not um, let people get off the hook of doing five or 10% of their work with this intent of being both, you know, integrity to financial return in my case and biodiversity goals, but all of the change the system, we're always going to be plugging a hole. So all our work needs to have this focus. And I just call that out to those that are in the audience to really consider and act towards. Thank you, Jennifer. Martin, please, one minute. Perfect. Let me pick up on, um, before I go to the carbon credits, let me pick up on what, uh, what attracts private uh, sector um, investors in, in, uh, in, in, in smaller conservation projects. And I think it's, um, it's not that they don't know what they're doing. I think it is more, um, they, they actually have certain expectations. And I think on the one hand side, there's clearly an, an expectation for, for an impact uh, and, and a measure of impact on the ground. That's, that's clearly one. But the other one is really also to, to make a return. No investor would, would, would provide money without making a return. And I think one of the key challenges with them, especially the smaller projects is that often the revenue streams are not, not clear. And I think we have to do more work to clearly spell out what type of revenue streams um, are available and when can they be achieved and, and perhaps how can also be some risks that are related to those um, revenue streams can be mitigated. And I think this is where public finance can really play, play a role. Um, what I think, in, 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 and this, this, this links nicely to, to carbon credits because I think the opportunity on, on carbon credits is really that they provide an additional revenue stream and that cuts both ways, not only for um, for the investor, but also for, let's say, for the smallholder, for the project owners on the ground. It is an additional revenue stream. Um, and, and if we manage to, to, to um, es establish carbon credits even, even more than, than, than they already have been, um, then, then I think it, it offers this opportunity to actually provide an additional revenue stream, which is really helpful for, to, to make projects more interesting and also have more revenues that can then be shared. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. I think it's time uh, to conclude. Uh, I, would, I, I would like to, it's difficult to maybe sum up all the ideas and inputs that you, you, you have uh, shared. Uh, I would like maybe to wrap up on the Im important idea of, of uh, uh, the need for a finance value chain approach where the funding can flow uh, transparently through all the stakeholders of the value chain and each one of them may be bringing additional value to the final beneficiary. May it be technical assistance, capacity building, maybe some technology, use of new technology, and of course, the adequate uh, financial products. In order to make this va finance value chain efficient and cost effective, and maybe this is also the way to make it more attractive for the investors. Um, and, and I would like before uh, to finish to say that I'm witnessing from where I stand in Africa in an agri bank that we have more and more intermediaries that are being created. We can see all uh, in all countries in Africa that new agri banks are being created with the purpose of stimulating the flow of finance from the north to the global south. And this is, I think, a very interesting perspective for the years to come. So with this, our session comes to uh, its end. I hope the participants have enjoyed it. And uh, I would like also to thank all the panelists, of course, for their insightful thoughts and thank the organization and technical team.
Thank you all for your participation.